Hello, and welcome to Unworthy History. On today's episode, I'm going to bring you some actual history from this book right here, 70 Years in Texas, Memories of the Pioneer Days, Indian Depredations, and the Northwest Cattle Trail, published by J.M. Franks back in 1924. Now, J.M. Franks was a citizen of Gatesville, Texas, and this story that we're going to read about today, it occurred over in Mills County, Texas. It's an Indian battle, an Indian attack that J.M. Franks remembers from his childhood. In the early part of the year 1858, a man with his family settled at what was afterwards called Jackson Springs, then in Brown County. The family consisted of himself, his wife and daughter, 18 years old, and three small children ranging in ages from 7 to 12 years. Late in the fall of that year, Mr. Jackson took his family out pecan hunting, intending to go to a place on the bayou where Al J. and Chas Kirkpatrick were getting out board timber. They had reached the middle of Jackson Valley, almost two and a half miles from home, when they were surprised by a band of Indians who brutally murdered the father, mother, daughter, and youngest child, and carried off the elder children, a boy and a girl. This murder was soon discovered by Kirkpatrick. The alarm was given and a runner sent to Camp Colorado to notify the soldiers who were stationed there. They immediately responded and Sergeant Ally White with 15 men started out to take the trail. The scattered neighbors gathered to perform the sad task of burying the dead. Wrapped in blankets, the bodies were buried where they fell, the father and mother in one grave and the two others in another. These lonely graves are still to be seen in the Jackson Valley, mute witnesses of the dangers which beset the path of the early settlers. This band of Indians continued their raid into Coriel County, stealing horses and on their way they crossed mountains near Mercer's Gap and into Brown County. The mail carrier saw them and turned back and gave alarm. The next day, Mr. Barcraft, Jas Barcraft, Dan Cox, who afterwards was killed in the Dove Creek fight, Tom Deaton, William Clements, Jesse Bend, John Carnes, James Hamsley, Sim Welch, Frank Collins, Lem Price, and two other men, all from Comanche County, took the trail in the middle of the afternoon. Six of the number went to Salt Gap, which was then a noted Indian passway. The other seven men followed the trail. When near Salt Gap, the six men saw the Indians going into camp on the bank of the creek at a spring. The settlers dropped back out of sight into a ravine, which they followed until everything was silent in the Indian camp, when they took a survey of the situation, and in doing so they ran into the Indians' horses, thirty head, which were quietly grazing out of hearing of the sleeping Indians. They drove them back to Blanket Creek, left them there, and returned to the ravine at daybreak. They charged the Indians who were getting up and making breakfast. The Indians were taken completely by surprise. Dan Cox killed one who fell in the creek, the others getting into a thicket except one who faced the whites and standing over the dead body of his comrade made the arrows fly so fast that the whites were forced to take to shelter of trees. He put 18 arrows into a tree behind which William Clements was standing and one through his clothes. Jas Bond was shot in the breast. Tom Deaton also had one shot through his clothes. Jas Bond, though badly wounded, finally recovered. The Indian supply of arrows was soon exhausted. He then made a dash for the thicket, badly wounded. The whites withdrew, and not having tasted food since leaving home, they started back on the trail. At Cox's Gap, they met some men from Coriel County, who were following the trail. From these men, they learned that the Jackson family were killed, also that the Indians had divided near Cox's Gap, a part of the band going a little to the south. It was then decided that the children must be with the Indians that went in the southerly direction, as they had not been seen during the fight. As the Coriel men had plenty of provisions, they rested long enough to eat a hasty meal and went back where the fight took place to look for the dead Indian to see if any more had been killed. From there they went south down to South Creek until they struck the other trail, followed it almost two miles and found where they had been camped the night before. 
The camp showed that the Indians had left in haste. They then scattered out following the general direction of the trail. A short distance further, one of the men thought he saw a human face peering from a thicket. This he told to the other men. The thicket was at once surrounded, but no signs of life could be seen. Two men were detailed to crawl into the thicket. They had not gone far when they discovered the two children trying to cover themselves with leaves. They could hear the men, but they thought that they were Indians who were trying to hide themselves. The children were worn out from their terrible experience and exposure. It was learned from the boy that when the fight commenced with the other band of Indians, the shooting could be plainly heard, and the Indians they were with broke camp and left them there. The children having recovered, the whole party returned home. Soon after, a married brother came after the children and took them to his house near Round Rock, Texas. I do not know whatever became of them. I was a small boy at that time, just about seven or eight years old, but I can remember it very well. I wish I could remember the names of all of the men that were in the party from Coriel, but you will remember I was but a child myself. I will give all of them that I can remember. F.W. Fountleroy, my father, D.R. Franks, John H. Chisman, Uncle Dan Hammock, Captain Hiram Cook, George W. Haley, and many others. I well remember the day when they got back. Most every man in the county was there that day that I knew. Ex-Governor Lubbock spoke in Gatesville that very day. I don't remember whether he was governor at that time or not. He might have been running for governor. I can't say, but I remember hearing him speak. I remember just how he looked. So that's the end of this story. Again, this is from this uh, book. I've only done one other show uh, from this book before, but it's uh, called 70 Years in Texas by J.M. Franks. So this is just uh, his memoirs, and he has several stories about Indian battles, many that he remembered just when he was a boy uh, in the 1850s and 1860s. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.